Hello everybody, welcome to uh, Long Bangers Podcast. This is episode 57. Uh, I'm joined by the other jokers from the Long Bangers Podcast. Uh, John, how are you doing tonight? I'm brilliant. I am shy, I'm up, I'm doing them back and forward. I can't work out if it's Tuesday or Thursday or what fucking day it is, so I'm just going to live in the moment and chat to you boys. That sounds good to me. Uh, also got Craig on, how are you doing Craig? I not too bad. I have had the shits for the past two days, oh, and uh, I've just I've just inhaled forty quid worth of Chinese in about fifteen minutes to get on here. So we'll see how long it lasts. <laughs> what did you have? Fucking everything. Uh, honey, honey glazed chili chicken. Yeah, boy. Oh, lovely, yeah, lovely. But honestly, I've been, I say I've been going out running and that, and trying to get a bit of fitness up and all that. And I was out the day, and I was about halfway through a 10k, and honestly, my asshole was just giving it fucking 50p, 20p, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you got a wee bit of the runner's tummy, did you? Oh, I've had, oh, mate, I've had it before, eh? We have, to do, we have to do a fitness test. I don't know if I've, I've told this story before. We have to do a fitness test in our job once a year, just to show that you're kind of, like, you're keeping a look after yourself. Um, and uh, it's a bleep test, you know, the one that they do up and down the line sort of thing. Yeah, and, it's with uh, somebody spares you every time you get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're fat. <laughs> but, uh, but I went up one morning because um, basically we were busy and working that and the whole, de- the whole department went out of date and it's quite a big thing. Like if you go out of date, like you start losing pay and stuff. So um, the boss was like, right, all you go up there and there's me, there's a boy that's been in for about 30, 40 years. He was 60 year old, like, you know, and, and my father, pal, we do, we're doing a run. I'm like, my, my stomach's not feeling that, that good, eh? Got to about level seven five, and I said, "I think it's a twenty meter dash, and you have to turn on the on the meter." And I turned, and as I turned, my ass just let out. <laughs> and when I and when I say let out, it was down my leg, like everywhere. So I was like, oh. Oh. "But luckily, it happened in the gym, and at the turning point, that the way I was running was directly for the door anyway." So I sprinted out. I was like, "Oh fucking hell!" And uh, afterwards, um. The physical uh, instructor came up to us. He's like, "Are you alright, mate?" He's like, "You didn't look like you were struggling or that." And you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly fit, but he's like, "You're not unfit." I was like, oh, "I just shat myself." <laughs> 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 he's like, "No," and I was like, "Mate, I've got no kicks on. I had to fucking ditch, ditch everything." <laughs> well, there's a Gary Lineker in it. Oh, mate, honestly, I'm terrible for it. That's leaving with a baby. So, when you were needing the day, did you find that improved your time? <laughs> Well, no, no, not at no. all. Because your legs start flaring about and all that, and you start sweating, man. And that, oh, fuck this. Thing is, you can't even just dive in for a shite in one of the local kind of like boozers or that, can you? Because it's all shut. Yep. That's it. Everyone's, uh, everyone's locked up. So, anyway, uh, welcome to your uh, usual Hibs podcast where we talk <laughs> all things Easter Road. <laughs> Unusual <laughs> Hibs podcast, I think you mean. <laughs> Uh, before we before we kind of get into the podcast properly, I, I, I'm going to read something out. So this landed on uh, Long Bangers HQ uh, doormat through the week. And it was sent by High Bees Allen, who's at Cabbage0762 uh, on Twitter. And it's a, a, an open letter that he'd come across from a Hearts fan. So if we cue the music, um, I'll read this out. He goes, this says, says, my son is eight years old. Tonight, he watched Manchester City thrash Liverpool. He knew all the lineups for both teams. He knew when to shout at VAR. There's an asterisk on VAR, we'll come back to that. A month ago, he barely knew that either even existed. He was, and still is, heart staffed. But something has changed. When the SPFL decided to put a gun to the heads of its constituent clubs, aka short shareholders, who knew? By offering money in return for ensuring Celtic were handed their nobody else really cares in a row title, Scottish football changed. Sure, underneath it all, things have been pretty skewered for a long time, but now it was out in the open. The big fish were to get their big feed and access to the Champions League, while the small fry would, you thought, be content with whatever scraps were thrown their way. My son was still on a high from watching Hearts win the last derby 3-1. We watched the goals daily. Sure, his optimism had taken a hit when we lost to St Mirren. (laughs) Asterix. But we still had 24 points to play for. 
And despite a jaded father who has seen his team stuff things up more times than he cares to remember, for an eight-year-old boy, his team will always have a chance. But no, that chance was taken away from him. Similarly, it was taken away from the fans of Partick, Inverness, Dundee, ironically enough, Falkirk and Stranraer. The wee bit of magic that football gives us by being 11 v 11 and on any given Saturday, etc. Your dedication to one team's needs ran roughshod over the things that all football fans should always have. Hopes and dreams for their team. After the corrupt vote you orchestrated at Easter, I tried to explain the situation to my son. Should be fucking good. Uh, now, before you get the wrong impression, he's no saint. He cheats. Snakes and ladders. Mario Kart. War gun fights. He makes no bones about trying to defeat his younger brother and myself. He can be sleek <laughs> or he can be outrageously shameless. <laughs> but when I tried to explain that, the football team, the only football team he's ever cared about, and bear in mind this kid lived in Catalonia and yet doesn't give a stuff for Barcelona, to be expelled from the top division for no apparent reason other than the administrator's desire to ensure Celtic could be handed a title that was already in the bag anyway. Even he looked at Nia Scans. That's a good word, eh? And said, but that's not fair. Sure, I tried to break down the PPT rule, which was invented to justify the decision. I told him how important money was. He actually gets this. He saves his pocket money to buy sale items in the heart shop, but he still wasn't convinced. I asked him to see it from the other club's point of view. He asked why they didn't like hearts. I couldn't give him an answer. <laughs> <laughs> even, <laughs> even one of your little licks, little lackeys, Les Gray, declared that what is going on is unfair. At least admit it, Neil. Tell us that you know demoting a team four points from safety with 24 to play for is unfair. Ask Werder Bremen fans what they think about making up point differences. Then, in the middle of lockdown, the Germans showed the way by playing football again. We'll skip Belarus, although I'm sure they could show you a few tricks in propaganda given the leader's Soviet-era cling to power at all costs mentality. <laughs> Keep it relevant. Uh, then, English football, which some of his friends talked about despite being Edinburgh born and bred, rave about. Until June, you see, my son had been taught to follow his local team, and only his local team, but not his Catalonian local team. Um, <laughs> he was obsessed with the foundation of hearts kept printed with the names of the thousands of fans that had helped keep our team alive. He loved hunting for my name. I was on minimum wage in Spain when I started paying into that fund. He loved this fact. <laughs> that the people around him at Tide Castle, no matter their circumstances, had some kind of collected spirit to keep something we love alive. Please tell us how much money you've taken out of Scottish football. Can you equate that with the value you've put in? Nobody even wants to sponsor your sham of a league. But he still couldn't get into his head why his team had been removed from the top league. Bear in mind, he's eight. Uh, now, you could call me irresponsible, but my son loves football so much, we've been out most days during lockdown playing in the meadows, that I allowed him to stay up late to watch football from Germany, England and Spain. He asked the same question most nights now though. Why can Hearts and the other teams not play now? Now, I'm not going to hold you to account for the Scottish Government's decisions around contact sports and when it's safe for these to go ahead. But the bit I do find hard to explain, perhaps you could, Neil, is why our season had to be called when others are able to resume at a later date. Was there someone in your ear? Were you under pressure to twist some arms? I mean, was this an equitable solution for anyone? My son is now watching the English Premier League every night, begging me to stay up late so he can see live football from just a few hundred miles away. He's got good eyesight. Uh, he's no longer <laughs> seeing his friends that they should support Hearts because you ought to support your local team. He's getting swept up in the hype and marketing that the EPL does so well. Last night I asked him if he was looking forward to seeing Hearts play again, no matter what league they play in. To be honest, he wasn't as bothered as he was a couple of months ago. He doesn't pretend to be Sean Clare. No wonder. <laughs> <laughs> or, Steve, or Stephen Naismith now where we play. He's Mo Salah or Kevin De Bruyne or Leo Messi. He sees them playing their games on the pitch, not in secretive votes and skullduggery. He also sees VAR decisions making sure that things are reasonably fair. He cares more about that word now than he did before. He started playing more fairly with his brother. 
He doesn't want to be unfair like what they did to Hearts. You've had quite the impact, even unintentionally. You see, Neil, an eight-year-old can see right through you, and whatever else helps you ram through your plan back in April. You've given another kid less reason to watch Scottish football and thrown them into the embrace of the mega leagues and their marketable product. You've been found out by a kid that still talks about the last cup final as though it was one of the most important days of his short life, even though his heroes lost it. Well done. Think how many other eight-year-olds in this country there are who don't understand why their team is going to come out of COVID-19 far more disadvantaged than the other teams. <laughs> be like Fuller <laughs> Amy. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Sure, I knew the ball was burst a long time ago and it wasn't your fault at all. But what happened in April and the nonsense which has followed it, well, that's on you. Whatever went on in April when you pressured clubs and I haven't even really mentioned the pathetically transparent and surprisingly successful attempt at coercion with the Nelms Chancellor at Dundee to call the season before the teams had a chance to discover that things even themselves out and find their true position in the league over a 38-game season as we were promised at the outset. Just at least tell us you haven't played it fair. We know it. My son knows it. Telling us anything else from here on is just lying. Uh, and then he goes on to say that if VAR had been in place, uh, St Martin wouldn't have got their goal, but uh, relegated them. Uh, and that's the end of what, uh, what a moving letter. What do you think of uh, that one, Craig? <laughs> that has got to be one of the best things I've ever heard in my life. I mean, it's it's got to top the list of things that did they fucking happen. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> For a, for a start, I mean, a grown man has sat down and come up with that story and dragged his poor boy into it. Oh, what a shame. The funny thing about it, though, is, is they, they're kicking off about this VAR, saying, oh, the goal would be a and all that. They had to win the game to fucking get out of the bottom spots. <laughs> Even if the goal didn't stand, they'd have drew it and they'd, <laughs> they'd have still been bottom anyway. <laughs> oh, there's so much to pick out of that, but... Oh, can you imagine sitting an eight-year-old down and trying to explain to them the votes and uh, the, the unfairness of it all? Absolutely fucking not. <laughs> <laughs> so just to just to uh, elaborate on Craig's points there about uh, sorry point about things that definitely did not happen. There's no danger this boy's got an eight-year-old burn because <laughs> this guy is definitely a virgin. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> um, there's so many. I thought it was a parody at first, then. I've scribbled a couple of things down there just as uh, as you were reading it out and there's obviously like there's a massive Celtic agenda there there's obviously wee bits about Dundee and St Mirren like there's obviously a oh what's it he's got a, a cross to bear with those three um, that he's talking about fucking equitable solutions and Soviet propaganda uh, things being unfair like I'm really fucking sorry mate but how many like how many people have you fucked off? How, sorry, how many teams, how many businesses has your team pissed on and bumped out of bills? And you want to talk about equitable solutions? Unfair. Get get away, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and moreover, moreover, my final point I'm going to say about this is that he's saying that his eight year old laddie. Um, he now plays more fairly with his brother because of fucking VAR St Mirren and the bloody <laughs> voting system in Scottish football. I'm not going to cheat Mario Kart because that's got relegated. Behave. <laughs> that's absolute <laughs> shite. He <laughs> can't understand why we're no longer in the top flight. Well, he's been watching them all season. Surely he's got a decent idea why they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, has, like, he ever, has he ever thought that he stopped caring for hearts and thinking about other teams because they're fucking dog shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and his pals, are pro- his pals are probably giving him fucking endless shit for being a jambo. <laughs> Your team's shite. <laughs> you know. I mentioned is he's cheating at Mario Kart on his Nintendo Switch or whatever while the game's going on. <laughs> no, no, no. He's in his bed for eight o'clock every night and he's thinking about Neil Doncaster having a big <laughs> try himself. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, see if the oh, see if the laddie's that much of a football fan. How come it is that he's playing? Uh, what was it? Fucking snakes and ladders, Mario Kart, and fucking water guns. There's no mention of a game of FIFA in there at all. Like, what's no, going on? It's because he's playing at the Meadows all the way through <laughs> lockdown. It's very well, one rule for them, one rule for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Anyway, that was. Uh, thanks for sending that in, uh, Hybies Alan. Um, 
Right, what's been happening? Not very much in terms of hip stuff. So the team's back training. Uh, we picture shown on social media the day, which tended to seem to upset a few folk, which was Canberra having a bit of banter with, I think, Stevie Mallon. Uh, John, do you uh, have a, a, a grudge at Canberra having fun while he's here? Aye. Um, whatever <laughs> happened to the old-fashioned play with, like, make them play with the reserves? Oh, no, we yeah. can't do that because we've mouthballed the academy, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sure I laughs> <didn't. laughs> much. If you're there, you're there, that's it. I'm that spiteful. I think I would open up the, the Reserve Academy just for Canberra to go and train by himself. So um, what do, you get, do you think there's any chance of him starting the game for us this season, Craig? I don't know about starting the game. Um, I mean, the picture itself and that, doesn't it wind, it doesn't wind me up? Eh? Like, when you was coming back, uh, do you know what the thing is, right? I, said, I think I said it at the beginning. I mean, we were all angry about it, but I think he's went there. He said some daft things. I don't. I honestly don't think he even really meant it in the way that it came out to the fans. If you know what I mean, like I don't think he went there to come and piss us off. Like you know what I mean. Um, I think. I think it was just daft because I mean you've seen after after the comments and that were made. It's social media. It's quite prolific on social media. It was all shut down. Like you know what I mean. So obviously his agents and that heads have got on him and been like, listen, stop talking. Like, you know, and and the whole thing, maybe I'm being a wee bit kind of devil's advocate or whatever, sitting on the other shoulder, but um, the whole deal with him going to Rangers was a very kind of last minute thing as well. So, like, it all happened in kind of like one day. He's probably been canting through it and all that. The fact that he's having a laugh with his mates doesn't really bother me. What kind of spiteful thing that, that kind of floats in my head is, is he's there under Jack Ross? Is this the first time he's been under Jack Ross, or did he go after Jack Ross? Uh, after so Jack Ross was in, and he played, played under Jack Ross, and then moved. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't that long, though, was it? And no. it wasn't really Jack Ross's team at the time, or whatever. So he's probably in training mm-hmm. there, looking at the team that Jack Ross is thinking about building and the style that he's wanting to play back at the, the big training centre and that. Like you know, I'm not saying we just don't have a big training centre, but back, you know, back back at the training centre. A professional outfit, and he's probably thinking, oh, "I fucked this year." <laughs> Jack Ross don't want him. The fans don't want him. Um, do I think there's a chance that he'll still be here? Possibly. Uh, I mean, we were alluding to earlier before we started that um, the transfer market's a wee bit iffy at the moment because of the, you know the whole worldwide situation. So there might be a chance that he stays. I don't think he'd start in the first few games. I don't think Jack Ross will have him in his team. You know, and, and his plan. Yeah. But if, but if things don't go to plan and time goes on and we end up having to keep him, then why? Why? What? I mean, I wouldn't. I maybe wouldn't make him a first team player. But why would you stick somebody as as we're saying there in, in the reserves when it all kicks back up? When really, it can be used as a say a substitute down the line or whatever. Like, uh, does it help Jack Ross, John, that the games will start behind closed doors? So he, he can he could effectively play Canberra, but it, you know any fans there to get on his back? Hey, probably. I I never really thought about that. <clears throat> I still live in this um, fantasy world. I think where there's going to be some sort of miraculous cure or difference in direction for the Scottish government, and we'll all just turn up at Easter Road on Monday, like and wondering why we were all getting uh, worked up about this. But um, aye, it's an interesting point of view, and actually. The, the optimist in me thinks that playing it behind closed doors for the first couple of games, like properly allowing the team to gel, maybe allowing, <clears throat> say, Jimmy Gullen, for example, the opportunity to play and sort of learn his craft a wee bit more in the top flight without people screaming at him for the sidelines, as all football fans can do at times. Um, it might it might work out to be quite a positive thing for us. You never know, we might find ourselves top of the league when we get back, into, uh, get back along Easter Road. That'd be decent, eh? That'd be right. Um, any, any rival fan listening into this podcast will be clipping that little snippet of you. Oh, talking did he? Oh. <laughs> 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 as well. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> as well. Um, and the, the, the fixtures come out, so we start off uh, Kilmarnock at home. Happy with that? I, I don't know. Like, See, because... Because, like we're, we're sort of entering unknown territory in terms of playing games behind closed doors. We don't really have much of a different squad. We've got a guy in there who 
at the last time uh, we saw him anywhere near Easter Road, he didn't want to play for us. He was pretty much signing up for the lodge. Um, <laughs> so how how do you ever judge and say, oh, I think Kilmarnock's a good opener? By previous season standards, you kind of look at Kilmarnock coming to Easter Road and you'd go, oh, he came up like a maybe fancy or chance every bit here, but every game is is an unknown quantity. Despite what I was saying before about like optimism and you know picking up points and whatnot, um, by previous year's sort of standards, you would look at the first five games and go, Kim, what, I could see us picking up a few points here. But now it could just be an absolute fucking free-for-all. I think I think the big thing is, is opening day of the season, you're happy if you're at home because it's going to be a massive day, like all the fans being there and all that. And Kilmarnock is a team that we know that we can get points off of, but they're a good team, eh? Like, there's no... And... Um, Make no bones about it. They are a good team, and it could either. I mean, this is like worst case scenario or best case scenario. You know, if we go out there and we hump them with no fans there first day of the season, or we even be, just beat them convincingly, I'm saying hump them. I just want them to get humped. That's all. But um, <laughs> but you go out there, then the team feel comfortable playing at home with fans or without fans. Like you know, they get that kind of that confidence. Like oh, new season, win at home, happy days. But it could go the complete other way, like you know, because you could go, you could go out and play at home, have a shock at a game, get humped, and then you don't have the fans to kind of, you know, give you that I little bit. You. So, on the on on the flip side of it, you can start your season off terribly, and then by the time fans come back, if you're in a bad position, fans are coming back to the first game of the season and they're already on top of you. Like like, there's not that kind of excitement for being back. It's just he's a fucking Aye. shite. You know what I mean? So it's like it's a weird one, isn't it? Like it's, it's just so hard to. That's a good point. Think about that. Like you, the, the fact that we'll be back, and, and we're not going back to when, when fans go back in. It's not the first day of the season where you've got the total optimism and the hope for the season ahead. And you've no really, other than a couple of pre-season friendlies at best, you've not had a a chance to see the team play together. By the time we're allowed back in the stadium, we could be in tenth place and playing absolutely honking. And so you kind of go in and, and you didn't have any of that optimism. It's just going to be shite for, for the one go. <laughs> you know, there's a flip side where we could be sitting second or whatever where you go in and, and you're absolutely buzzing to see them. But it's a fun, it'll, it'll be a, a funny situation to be in. Yeah, that's for all clubs, are not it? But I can, yeah. I can absolutely guarantee you, though, I can't remember his name, and even if I did, I wouldn't say it. But we, we've had a wee conversation about him. Yeah. Somebody, from, somebody from an online uh, Hibs, uh, I don't know, uh, well... Hibs don't know. Aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where if we were second or we were tenth and he's been dying to get back to the football on that day one, he'll still have a complaint and go, nah, I'm oh. not fucking going. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like it if the football, when we watch it with our season tickets and our live streams that we've got access to, that it's competitive because the stuff that I've seen down in England where they've been playing out the season it looked like they were going through the motions. It didn't. It just looked like they were, I like I say, going through the motions. Not really that bothered. Um, see, hopefully, see it's got that. On that point, John, are you, did you keep watching it? Like, are you still watching the games now that are happening? Uh, uh, no, this point? was this was pre Liverpool winning the league. So I think I watched. Oh, who was I watching? I watched Man City against someone. Um, I think Man City won maybe three or four nil. Um, I can't remember watched two or three others, and I, I don't know. Like maybe it's just my my sort of general view of the 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 Premier League down south. Um, I think Craig maybe mentioned it before about the the way that they market the game. In fact, or it could have been that boy in the where's the boy? I in the, the <laughs> I open like letter. Sorry, Craig, I that back. Now, eh? <laughs> I know you. I know oh, you that's... view uh, kick back, but um, I I just I don't always think that the English Premier League's that is is as good as it's cracked up to be. I think there is a lot more marketing goes into it and less end product. But See what I, that's I, just my, my opinion. The, the point I was going to make is that the games that have happened more recently, like this week's games, have been better, like they're like night and day to the first games when they came back. It was like pre season. It's like Kevin, you're looking at uh, players getting up to match fitness. Yeah. That's what the games have been better. I mean, they're still, I mean, it's not the same without fans, and there's no, Kevin, there's no two ways about it. You can't even really dress up any other way. It's not the same without fans. But the games have been getting better as the players have been. Kind of get uh, getting their sharp, sharpness up, yeah. aye. Ah, okay, so yeah. uh, maybe once can the, the Scottish clubs go back with a pre-season behind them, 
or, although it's not going to be a standard pre-season, I suppose, but you would hope they're at a decent level of fitness at the time the games kick off. So when is it the Scottish Premier League kicks off? Is it the 1st of August? August, aye. Aye, so what? We're on the 7th of July now, so we've got about three weeks to try and cram a, a pre-season in. Aye, but and then start up. And it's important as that, and probably the next topic to talk about is we need to build the team. So, um, Craig, if I start with you in this one, if you're Jack Ross, what are your uh, priorities? Like, which areas are you trying to strengthen? Oh, um, it's tough, isn't it? Because it all depends on, for me anyway, it all depends on uh, like big movers like Boyle. If Boyle doesn't go, then it changes the whole dynamic for me. I always I thought somebody in at left back um, was a big thing. Maybe not. I'm not saying just to, to completely take the place or lose, or lose straight away, um, but just to, to challenge for it. Like you know what I mean to 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 have a bit of fight there. Maybe somebody else in at the back. I know Portis coming back, but without a like without a solid back line. I mean, Hibs, Hibs seem to just struggle with eh? And that must, that, I mean, that's any team. That's just their kind of, like, you know, their own personal thing because we watch them. But we, I think we need a solid back line and a centre, central defensive midfielder. I think strike-wise, I'm happy for Gullant to come in alongside Dodge. I think Dodge um, is, has grown since he's been here. And, like, you know, compared to the way that Hibs fans viewed him, rightly or wrongly at the beginning, yeah. You know, it completely changed. I don't think we really need to. I mean, it would be nice. Of course, it would be nice. You always want a striker, didn't you? You always want like a like a like a big name like signing that's going to score. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, to be honest, I'd be I'd be quite happy to start the season with Gullen and and Dodge. Um, oh, I don't know. I, I'm just like, do, do you know what the thing is with the whole transfer business and that at the moment is is because nothing's happened, and it's not anything against Hibs believe it or not because I know other teams have made signings and that but it's been made difficult for us because we're trying to get rid of Cam Berry, who will be bigger wages I would guess and a good amount of money coming in there's all the rumours around Boyle I know he's started um, training and all that but that would have been normal anyway I would, I would reckon yeah. um, unless he was actually physically off the books and gone I think Jack Ross is in a bit of a difficult situation uh, and I don't think it's down to uh, to lack of Hibs fund and I think it's down to just the market being shite and in the situation we are with trying to get rid of players bringing in people without getting like, it's just so difficult eh? it's just oh, fucking I go on fucking dot net now and again and have a wee read it or the oh I know somebody and they know and it's all shite and it's just so <laughs> much happening John what about you where would you focus your attention um <laughs> So I was going to I was writing down a couple of notes there again. Um, the transfer window. When does that open and when does that close? Was there any movement and adjustments with seasons? Um, it's open now, and I believe uh, UEFA are looking to keep it open until October. No Although danger. Doing, I've not seen it confirmed, but uh, uh, my understanding is that is what's been proposed. See that could. So with the. With the with the market the way that it is in terms of players, like Craig had mentioned there, a couple of players have been uh, signing for a couple of clubs, but normally at this sort of time of year, we're in a pre-season territory, we're in a transfer market speculation, you know, players coming in, players leaving, we're not really there. So the squad is pretty much as it was last season, but we've lost players like, uh, what's his chops? Uh, Jason Naismith. So we've lost him. Yep. Uh, who else did we lose that we so had on loan? Mignolga. Aye, so all, all these Dog guys are away. But, it, you know, a lot of folk have pointed at the the academy and said, you know, we're not really bringing anyone through. Well, now is the opportunity to bring these guys on. Like, if the if the academy's been mothballed, get them on the, get them on the, the bench or get them in the first team and start giving them the opportunity to show whether they're capable or not. Um, especially because while we're being careful with the money that we have at our disposal, um, as much as um, Ron Gordon had said that they were going to invest it in the first team squad or whatever, no one's really moving, no one's really doing anything. So, th- like, there is definitely, I know this is a- an odd way to answer your question, Matty, like, there's definitely areas to strengthen, like, we- we've talked about it at length before. Um, 
Craig, you mentioned um, someone challenging Lewis Stevenson. I, I, I can't honestly tell you what the situation is with Sean Mackey. I think the last time I heard about him was he'd uh, Hibs had identified um, some surgery that he needed on a, an ankle injury, but surely he's still a Hibs player now. Is he a player now that's had a bit of first-team experience elsewhere that could possibly come in and be that challenger rather than spending money that we might not have or might not want to commit on another player there? I should have um, caveat, I should have caveat this with I am fucking shite with players' names, positions and that. Like see all the kind of <laughs> see see all this football manager nonsense. I'm fucking awful with it. Like, you know. I like I like the football and the kind of the rabble behind it, but sometimes honestly, I couldn't fucking tell you I left back to a fucking right mid or who's a number who, who the fuck's a number eight? Like, you know what I mean? People uh, see see if you talk to me about football, right, and you start coming out with numbers that aren't ten or one. Fuck off. <laughs> fuck. I've not got a Scooby. Uh, Craig, honestly, I'm about the same. Um, I'm amazed that I managed to remember Sean Mackey there because I quite often look at, uh, sorry, excuse me, other players outside the Hibs squad when I'm watching them on a Saturday. I've got no idea who they are. Um, so <laughs> if someone were, asked me... Game players for every club. And I think it's it? When you were wee and you used to ken all the players for every club. Yep. And I think it's because Panini stickers. <laughs> I was a game changer because you you kept who you needed and who who you had, and you recognise obviously the first uh, person two pins like. you kept in each team, each squad. Whereas when you grow out of Panini stickers, I think that's the point where you start losing track uh, on other teams' players. So I can tell you, like when I was we, I can tell you who Hibs first eleven was, who Hearts first eleven, Mullerwell, Kim, whatever. Now, I, I mean, there was a when Don Kelly played for Hearts. I think he stayed in Dunfermline. I went and parked my car in one of the, the uh, paying display car parks and there was a boy coming out offered me his... He says, I'm just leaving. You want my ticket? So I said, that's fine. And I went and stuck it in my window. Went up. I was going to get my haircut. Went to the barbers and uh, they were saying, oh, we just had Don Cowie in. And that's who it was. That was who gave me... And I wouldn't have kept him for Adam. I would have told me to shove his stick up his arse. <laughs> arse past <him. laughs> But, uh, aye, it just goes to show, like, uh, even, even like, you see them the game here and there, but... I wouldn't recognise them. And I, bl- I blame it on growing out of Panini f- uh, football stickers. I, bl- I blame it on, like, when you when you lose interest in that and you start gaining interest in getting your hole. Aye, there's that <laughs> as well. A lot, if, you can, if you can name who plays in position number three for any team in the SPFL, Virgin. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's sure. it. So, I, so long so, story short, there's players there that can come in. Players are coming back, full on as much as we've lost them. Uh, focus on youth, breed, breed. Is that the right word? <laughs> oh, dear <laughs> me. Let's uh, <laughs> propel the next golden generation to the forefront, if you will. <laughs> ah, I gave them a chance, hundred percent. Right. I, 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 I never, I never thought about that with the um, with a mothball in the academy. And that. It's the perfect opportunity to get people into the first team and tra- and at least train with them. Like, you know what I mean? The, th- the thing with that is, uh, I mean, speaking to uh, James McDonough, one thing I used to, when I used to write the under-19 match reports, and I did an interview for him with uh, for the, the match day programme, it was, and we were talking about the golden generation coming through. I always remember, he's, he pretty much said, none of those players were banging down the door of the manager for a game. The only reason that they got a game was necessity. It's because we couldn't afford to play anybody else. And you look at the quality of them, you know, obviously they were good players and you, you can't take that away from them. They probably would have made it anyway. But circumstances dictated they, they played in the first team and they played regularly in the first team and then they, they, they pushed on. But it could have been really different. I mean, there's a famous story about Bobby Williamson going to swap Ryerdon and Whitaker, I think, for Bobby Mann. Bobby Mann, eh? Right. And, and you think that's how easy it would have been for things to be different if Hibs had money and were able to bring in players like experienced European players like that, as was the, the norm at that time, then boys like Brown and Thompson and Ravin would have had to have waited a lot longer to get their chance and they might never have made it. So maybe this is a wee blessing in disguise for the young players at, uh, at Hibs and out they can get a chance. And I think the other thing that's going to impact it is what cover already exists and can you justify spending money? So you look at uh, right back, for example, you've got Gray and you've got um, McGinn can both play there. So you've got two experienced pros you can pretty much write off as bringing in a, a right back. You couldn't bring Naismith back in and have three of them there when you're tight for money. But there is Play. a, I forget his name, there is a young lady that plays for the, the development squad. Um, so he's, he's... left back, Doig. Oh, maybe it's Doig I'm thinking of. Sorry, is he a left back? I thought he was a right he's back. Left back. 
We can't have a Doidge. We can't have a Doidge and a Doig, surely. Fuck well, me. it's a Marlon Allen Doig Doig. Um, aye. Fuck but you've me. got. Um, I'm sure Tommy Block. I saw um, preseason. He played at the back as well. Because I think it seemed to be at least in the game that I watched against um, Linlithgow. Um, and people that go along to the development squad games more will be able to tell me. But it seemed like they were quite keen on rotating players through different positions. Because um, I think that was maybe where I saw Gullen for the first time before I saw... Or might have been around about the time I saw Gullen and Campbell. They were all playing at the same time. Because I thought Josh Campbell was going to be playing in uh, Hibs first team squad last year. But then he got put on loan to Arbroath. So there's definitely, <clears throat> from what I saw in the early uh, portion of pre-season last year, before players started moving out on loan, what have you, I, I feel like there's real quality amongst the, the youth players that we've got and they should be given a chance. Uh, it be interesting to see what uh, what happens. One of the questions we got in through the week on uh, Twitter was from Neil Renton. Um, and it was about playing uh, games behind closed doors. Uh, and what Neil said is if the games start behind closed doors, what are you going to do to recreate the Easter Road experience? He said he was going to go to the kitchen for a macaroni pie, only to discover that there's only quavers left. Um, <laughs> I have to stand outside the kitchen for 20 minutes first day before you get there and miss the start of the second half to get the authentic experience uh, John what about you how would you uh, bring Easter Road to life when you're watching it on the TV I'll maybe put uh, I'll try and engineer like uh, a loose wire in my surround sound so that I've got that dodgy dodgy speaker effect in the famous five <laughs> <laughs> what about you Craig oh, I'll just do my usual Fucking cry, cry into my fucking heart. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of that. I, I, I love going to watch him. Zed. I love it, right? But I, like my dad, like, he pisses himself laughing at me every time, especially see heart scares and that. I get proper butterflies, eh? And like, I think before that that last uh, heart scare, I was, I was messaging you, Johnny, and I was like, oh, I don't feel good about this and all this sort of business. Like, you know, and even you were giving me stick, like, fucking come on. Honestly, I, I'm like a shit and dog. Every time fucking Hibs play, I don't even, I don't get, it could be a pre-season game and I'm sat there fucking thinking, oh no, please just score first, like, you know, <laughs> fucking sad act, so I'll probably just be cowering away in a corner, kind of like you are the now, John, actually. Hi, look at I'm, this. I'm, I'm just sort of um, leaning back against the chair, um, try to just put my feet up, try to relax a wee bit while I talk to you two. Well, the so people come across on the podcast, right, right but we're, we're on a video Skype call and uh, John's Dark, you know, you expect in any minute a bright light to shine on his push, but a German term that they've got ways of making him talk. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting totally, almost a complete silhouette every now and again when Craig and I are talking. He'll uh, look wistfully out the window, sort of with his arm up on his window ledge, just peering out of his back garden and next door's shed. Do you reckon uh, he does have that man gagged up next to him having a wank? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Uh, well, I would give you a bit of back into that story because that was in a WhatsApp group previous, but I'll just leave that to your imagination. Eh? <laughs> uh, Sorry, my um, my webcam's only just kicked in. I don't know if any of you pressed the wee button or something, but I didn't realise I was sitting in almost uh, near darkness that entire time. Is that any better? No, your webcam's been on the whole time. It's just my, I maybe shouldn't say it's my Andy Johnson laptop, because uh, without any prior context, that sounds a bit suspicious. I'll have the Polish one checking the hard drive now. Again. <laughs> that, was, that was Adam Johnson, wasn't it? Aye. Oh, sorry, Andy Johnson was the other one. Fuck. Aye. I'm going to get done for libel and for dodgy hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> oh. See, that, that, that's this week's Freudian slip. I, I just can't help myself. I'm always getting something wrong. I'll tell you what, we're just a, we're a bunch of jokers, aren't we? <laughs> Impersonators. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, what else has been happening? Amanda Jones left. Uh, that was announced today. She left the board of directors. Uh, I didn't really care what to say, but she got, she got on a better job. And one of the things that was a prerequisite there was to give up any other directorship she had. So only ever heard good things about Amanda Jones. So uh, for the podcast, I suppose we wish her all the best. Right. Um, the other thing that, that was uh, just appearing on Twitter as, as before we started was uh, a wee rumour that St Mirren were going to be coming to uh, Hibs for our first pre-season friendly now that's an interesting choice of opponent given the circumstances everything that's going on now 
Uh, John, would you be doing anything special to mark the occasion? I might, I might add to my Jack Ross, John McGinn, John Obika shrine upstairs, <laughs> and just uh, say a wee prayer in front of it if I can go to Easter Road. Well, were you saying you were mentioned before we started that you reckon we could perhaps have a guard of honour? Aye, for the, for the man himself, Mister Obika, <laughs> all management staff, anybody that can safely make it, get out and clap the man. One of the, the things that's been uh, brilliant over the last uh, few weeks has been the discovery of the uh, there's a Smirren fan on Twitter called Carter's Corner, I think his, his Twitter handle is, yep. who almost relentlessly and mercilessly trolls Hearts fans. And he's just, he, he has them biting left, right and centre. Uh, well worth a follow if you don't already uh, follow him. Um, and then I suppose that that kind of segues nicely into the other thing that might impact how next season looks, particularly on a financial level, which is uh, the whole court case and, and the arbitration. Um, who wants to kick off with their thoughts on that? I think I'll have a go. Good name. Because if people haven't seen on Twitter, I had a wee dig at Tom English after they... Um, Put out a tweet. It was it was post the um the Dundee United uh statement or joint statement whatever it was, asking for crowdfunding and other clubs to help financially back the um the their, their their legal action of defence yeah um and I kind of, to be honest I kind of got it wrong the first tweet I read it wrong it, I read it as he was saying that it's fine for Hearts and Partick to to fight their own um unfair dismissal but not for Dundee United to fight their possible unfair re-relegation after winning the league sort of idea and I was corrected on that and that's fair enough like, you know, I'm, I'm a fucking clown anyway but um, I was trying to um, I was trying to have a, to be honest I was trying to have an open dialogue we all have a laugh here right at hearts and fucking right we should do don't get me wrong I don't think we have to because I think Coonster and his wee Doug they, 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 do, they do they do plenty <laughs> But, he um, has crowdfunding a flag uh, for his dog. I just want to mention that. Is he? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> Super. <laughs> but um, I was trying to be diplomatic about it. I had quite a quite a few people uh, of of different fan persuasion reply, um, and I just want to please if anybody's listening that isn't a Hibs fan or or her, Fucking read every little bit of information you get before you start coming out with your bullshit, right? See, Aye. see this fucking. Why can they finish the league and, and we can't? We should finish the league. We could never have finished the league because we've only just got back to contact sport now through government guidelines. The eight-year-old knew that, you know what I mean? So fucking, <laughs> if you can't Aye. understand that, don't. And you know what I mean. And the thing that gets me is, yes, right if. <laughs> If I'm in, I've said this on the podcast before, right? If Hibs are in Hart's position, I want Hibs to be doing everything that they can to fight their corner. Because I, you would be a of course you would be, right? But just like any other sort of footballing incident that where you're seen off or, or your team's in the upper, whatever, right? I fully expect Hearts, right, if if they win this arbitration or whatever, to come back and give us endless amounts of stick, right? For anybody to turn around and give, like, say, sporting integrity as a comeback to some fucking patter, get fucked. You know what I mean? The whole thing about football is, is we're here to take the piss of each other. I think you, I think in your exact words, Matt, it was, it's an open goal, isn't it? If, Aye. Like, like, if, if we don't take the piss out of Hearts for this, then then what's the fucking point? There's no rivalry, is there? You know what I mean? And I think a lot of people can see that, but I was trying, I was going back to the original tweet, I'm away on a tangent here. Um, I was trying to be diplomatic about it and say, listen, if I was in their situation, I get it. And I'm not saying that the joke, uh, the joke, sorry, the, the vote wasn't a farce. I think the whole, the way that the vote was taken as in like, you know, they came out, here's, here's a fucking stupidly long document, read it and vote on it. This is the only thing that can happen. And they gave it within like 24 hours or something, daft like that. And then the whole debacle with releasing the the results of the vote, the Dundee vote, no getting oh, not all that malarkey. I'm not saying that the vote wasn't a farce. Right. What I'm trying what I'm trying to say is the SPFL handled it wrong in the first place. But we we can't change that. That can't be changed. And to then go on and say, oh well, you need to vote for a 14-team league, say. 
because if you don't, it's not it's not uh, sporting integrity and you're not doing it for the good of Scottish football. You were never doing it for the good of Scottish football. You were doing it for the good of yourself. The problem is the SPFL should have basically shut up shop and said, right, listen, well, the vote's been done. We'll sit yeah. down with all the, all the member clubs, take a week or two maybe, and we'll try and hash something out. Somebody is going to lose out. You know what I mean? The, you're not going to get everybody winning because even if somebody turns around and says, oh, but if everybody gets promoted and nobody gets relegated, everybody wins. Everybody doesn't fucking win because you're ending up with like a fucking 10 team split at the bottom or something like that. Hundreds of games that are fucking pointless. There's yeah. so many other things that go along with it. And see, trying to drill it into these thick cunts on, <laughs> on Twitter that, <laughs> all right, I'm one, I'll give Hearts a 100%. But I'm not going to turn here and be a hypocrite and say, "Listen, if if Hibs weren't in a situation, I wouldn't like I wouldn't I wouldn't feel aggrieved either." But that's the whole fucking point. But they just can't see it, and I don't I don't know how you feel on it because I know you were you were uh, trolling. And there's some great points that people make as well that Aye. that sound like banter that aren't banter. Like I think um, one of the posts that you put up, Matt, it was um, was saying something along the lines of there could have been no other outcome. Aye. Um which, which I completely agree with. And people are like, oh, no, no, but that's not... There couldn't have been another outcome. But that's not... And then they, t- they turn around and say, who's to blame then? It's not the who's to blame. The SPF... If anybody's to blame, it's the people running the SPFL. I'm not saying the SPFL as a whole, because I know the SPFL is the clubs. Yeah. But the people but the people at the top of the SPFL made the decision too quickly, from, in my personal view... And never spent the time speaking to anybody. And the way that it, the way that it plays out in my head is now it's working perfectly for Neil Doncaster and, and Co. Because we're all fighting the argument on Twitter. You've got the media fighting one side. You've got the clubs fighting it. And then it's the, it's put teams against teams, fans against fans. And I understand that there's always fans against fans as banter. But as I as I alluded to on Twitter, I think it's got to the point of no return now because. If there was any chance of sitting down with everybody and saying, right, people are going to lose out, but we can we can mitigate, well, maybe not mitigate against it, we can, I don't know, like I mean, find you could, you could find find, find find some way of of you know um, lessening the the like losses and all that sort of business, right? But the fact that he's left it to the clubs and it's spilled out into the media and it's spilled out into the fans, because don't forget, half the reason that this is so vitro and all that online is because a lot of the chairman and that were getting that raging that they came out publicly, like the date, like with WhatsApp groups and daft shit like yeah. that. It's, <laughs> gone, it's, gone, it's gone beyond the point of no return now. You can't get all those teams to sit down in, in, in boardrooms and that. And it's a fucking difficult enough job as it is anyway. I look at it from a Hibs point of view, right? But a Hibs podcast, I'm fucking run to get it, right? Hibs point of view. If Hibs are put down for a vote, say, for um, uh, expanding the league, right? The board members could be sitting down there as a business, purely as a business, and be thinking, right, we expand the league, hearts stay up, we get more money from gate receipts from hearts. If people, and this is, again, this is hypothetical because people might not make it into the grounds. Aye. We get more gate receipts from them, more big money games, perhaps, whatever. But then, the bit, but then they've got to get out of that business thing and they go, well, the people that, that put money into the club are all these fans. And if we vote for that, the fans turn against us. And if the fans turn against us, that's a lot. That you know, end game, that's business suicide, isn't it? Yeah, it's like but, Ratners, isn't it? When they they tell the jewelry was shite. Yeah, you, so you remember that. But then, but then, but then they turned it to sport and integrity. It's not. It's nothing to do with sport and integrity. It's clubs are businesses. And they've got to look after their business. And you can't turn around and, you know, like, it just it infuriates me about how people can't see it. Like, you know what I mean? And, all right, it's, it's different for us because the team that are directly um, involved in it are hearts. And I understand that. And it, but Are you saying that I, we can't give an impartial view? I, but I just, I just wish people would fucking open up to it because see, the sooner people start having this kind of dialogue, the sooner that the media, like the, in my head anyway, the sooner that the people in media online and that start maybe having this dialogue rather than taking one side more than the other. The thing is, the fan has been stoked that much, and I'm all for fan rivalry. I fucking love going to a derby 
whether you get pumped or not. I love getting shy. I just and I love getting it right fucking up them. But where, where's the game going to go? Because even after arbitration and all that finishes right, somebody wins, somebody loses, doesn't matter, right? What what happens next? You know what I mean? Because we've still got to get fans back into the stadium. Once fans are back into the stadium, we've got to look at football as a whole. We've got to look at the SPFL. We've got to look at Doncaster. We've got... How are we going to get everybody to sit down in one fucking room? Um, it's just it's <clears throat> and it's just never going to happen. And then all this sporting integrity and talking about the the greater good of Scottish football is going to come to nothing because we can't change the rules and we can't change uh, you know the the stigma around the vote the voting system, for instance. And we can, like it's it's fucking it's it's nonsense. Just fucking. Oh, sorry. I'm um, hosa. <laughs> The thing that gets me with it is, is the so I listened to the Terrace podcast earlier on the day. Uh, my mate Colin sent me a message to go and listen to this. They're talking about the decision for when it was kicked out of court, and it's a Kilmarnock fan and a Dundee fan that were on it. So it's quite a, a good way to um, see what the viewpoint is like when you know you didn't have that emotional attachment of either being a Hearts fan and an idiot uh, and a Hibs fan where you, you want to see them suffer, right? And the, the boy, it, it was like a a window into what the media should be like with the way that he described it because he just stuck to facts. He stuck to things that actually happened and then the practical the practicalities of it. So like you say, Craig, right, the, the decision to end the, the season. So if we take that as our starting point, like COVID happened and it became apparent very early on that we weren't going to be able to play football. Now, whether that decision was taken at that point, this is maybe where I disagree with you a wee bit in, in terms of the timeline of it. Um, whether the decision was taken then on day one or taken tomorrow, when we've got, you know, we know that the next season's going to start in a couple of weeks' time, it didn't really matter. It was evident that you couldn't play out the season. UEFA wanted the season done and dusted by the 3rd of August. That was their deadline. Now, we are starting a new season on the 1st of August. We can already see that um, players, in some cases, are going to have to play four games in eight days due to the fixture congestion that's coming up next season. There is no room to play extra games in there. You couldn't say, we'll start the first of the season and the point that we pick up is game 30, whatever, you know, 31 or, or 32, whatever it was that was left to play in this season. You have to say this season's done and dusted. There's no time to play it. You couldn't have ditched the, the League Cup because that's after the 3rd of August. So all your options to play this season have gone. The only option, whether you took that decision months ago or whether you took it today, was to, to end the season. And then UEFA said, right, you can still have champions and we want to know if you're putting somebody forward for a UEFA Cup place or a sorry, Europa League place or a Champions League place or you're doing promotions and relegations, it has to be done on a sporting basis. So the fairest way to do that is on the points per game. So the only way that the, the SPFL had to wrap up that situation, knowing that there has to be promotion for the, the teams that win the league and the leagues below and relegation to accommodate those teams, was to take it on points per game. And that's what they did. That's what they voted on. The decision to end the season was right. It wasn't done to give Celtic nine in a row and deprive Rangers, who were already miles behind them. It, it wasn't done to give Celtic a title. It wasn't done to stick up hearts because... You know, let's take the chance to relegate them for, for what reason? Like, why would the SPFL take one of their biggest clubs and deliberately kick them out of the league? They wouldn't do it. But that was a sporting basis, points per game. That had to happen. That's the facts of the matter. And it's a fact that they couldn't have finished the season. That there's no practical way they could do it. And if somebody could show me a practical way, I'd, I'd be quite happy to stand corrected. And then you go into what you said about the reconstruction debates. Nobody at any point has voted to keep Hearts in the Championship. That was never on the table. The vote was, do you want a 14-team top flight? And then the rest of the leagues, however, I can't remember how they were they were set up. But that proposal was shite. And you can go back to Anne Budge, who led a group, and she did nothing. The amount of chairmen that have been on the radio since that said she never picked up the phone to me, they never asked us for input in it. Go and do some work. If you're that bothered about your club not getting relegated and you want a re reconstruction, put a bit of fucking effort into it. Then they just come after and say, oh, everybody was self-interested and they listen to us. Go and find out what the clubs want. Go and find a proposal that works. Because I, I can guarantee you, because of the financial impact they're not having hearts in the league, right? they do they have a, a decent-sized support. You're looking at Hibs missing a, a, a two derbies, or, or, or at least one derby, uh, depending on you know, where everybody is after the split. 
you're mm-hmm. not going to lo- deliberately lose out on that money if you didn't have to. So if they could come up with a, an option that said, here's reconstruction that benefits everybody, it would have got voted through. I guarantee it. Nobody would have sat and went, ah, do you know what, that's really good for us, but we're not going to do it because we want to see Hearts get relegated. That's just nonsense. And to, to think that that's a, a line of thinking is it's mental. I mean, you'd have to be an idiot to, to, to think that. So everything that's happened it has to have happened. I didn't see any other option for it. And it is harsh on Hearts. So you can't... Have, you can't kind of disagree, right? You, you would be feeling aggrieved if you're that team that's sitting with eight games to play and you're getting relegated. You think, fuck, we could have got out of that. But, and, and this is again where I disagree with you. I, I'm quite pragmatic with these things. See, if it was Hibs in that situation, I'd take it. You go, right, fine, take, take the season in the Championship, we'll come back up. You know, we've been there before, we survived, we could do it again. Somebody's got to go down. And if you're the, the bottom team at the time the league's finished, you go down. Just relegation happens. It's, it's harsh on every team that gets relegated. Nobody wants it. So, I, I just find the whole argument is off founded with, with, with folk coming at it through angles that aren't they, you can't back them up. They're all based on a kind of false argument. And you've got folk like Tom English and that who drive this kind of false narrative that there's, there's you know, undue unfairness on hearts or that there was this other utopian alternative that would have kept everybody happy that somehow everybody decided again. It's fucking nonsense. That, that doesn't exist. This is the least unfair outcome that you could possibly get. And it, it sucks, right? If your heart's and you're going down, you're going to be pissed off and it's going to suck. Deal with it. I mean, they're not going to be that badly off. They've just went and taken Robbie Nielsen for Dundee United. They've just signed Craig Gordon. They're not pleading poverty here. You know what I mean? Take it, come back up, and then just get on with it. By the way, John, you're going to have to smile or something. We need to see your teeth because he's pitch black in your camp. <laughs> I, was just going to, I was just going to turn the light on and I'll be back this way. Rick Heavy's got I, 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 think, I, I agree with you. I just think that. I think it's just the handling of the situation. Aye, that could be better, undoubtedly. Aye. 100%. And I think, I, I, pers- I, I, said, I personally think that if it was handled better in the sense that that decision to end the league had to happen, and I agree with that, but as I say, maybe if they just waited a little bit longer, not to... Not for like the fans' sake or whatever, but to sit, but to actually sit down with board members right. and other clubs and say, "Listen, this is what's going to have to happen. So we need to figure out how we're going to go about, like either next season or." I have your point. Aye, I agree with that. They, they could have spent that time better to rather than rushing rushing through the conversation around it to say, "This is we know this is going to be what the outcome is." How do we get to that point? Is is, is probably what they could have done uh, better, but. Uh, even the noise around the Dundee vote, Dun- the, the SPFL, and there's all this talk about oh, they're, they're strong arming folk and they were trying to persuade people to vote. So they should have been. The best, the only outcome that works is to end the season. If the clubs had voted against that uh, resolution, it would have been back on the table the next again week when they went, right, we're a week down the line, we still can't play football. Do we leave this for three weeks when we still can't play football? Or do we just actually kind of let everybody plan, let us pay out the payments that we need to pay out and do it now? Who's it that would actually be strong arming though? Because the SPFL is the clubs and they're represented by members the board, of their clubs. So the, the, board, the board would decree because the board the board should act in the best interest of the club, right? So when they're there, they, they act on the club's instructions when they have to pass motions or whatever, but they still also have like an executive responsibility where in a situation like this where they're going, right, if the clubs didn't vote for it, it's going to damage everybody. We're going to have to step in and actually say, as a board, this is what's happening. Yeah. They could do that, that's but, but, but see, but this is the point I'm making. I completely agree with you. The point I'm making is, is it was made out that like Neil Doncaster was personally phoning people and saying, "This is what I want. This is what I want." But it's not. It's it's what I the, 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 group of, what, the group it's, of the clubs. Well, that's it. He, he should have been an S, as as a representative of the SPFL board. He should have been as incumbent on him to be lobbying people to say back this resolution, get it through. They, you know, go and persuade them. The folk who are saying, no, we didn't really want to end the season now. You should be saying, right, why do you know what to do it? And this is why you're wrong and this is why you should vote to back the resolution. 100% he should do it. It's incumbent on him. It's his responsibility to do it. That's no underhand. It's no uh, criminal no. Or, or illegal or, 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 you know, anything the hearts are claiming. They're, like they, they expect to have this big fucking smoking gun because they've got the, the, the documents released. There's no, the boy's a solicitor. You know, he's, he's, he's trained a solicitor. I think he's going to have a trail of stuff where he's like, and oh, here's this email, Neil, where you've offered uh, John Nelms at Dundee 
uh, a hand job and a hundred grand if he changes his vote. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because the, 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 these emails are going to exist. Uh, they can't the, and if they say, oh, look, you were trying to change their mind, he'll be standing quick going, of course I was trying to change their fucking mind. It was, if we didn't vote that, uh, vote that through, the game's on its arse. We have to end the season. Yeah. Of course I try to change his mind. There's no, that's no smoking gun. That's like fucking what should have happened. And there's already been an independent investigation. So, what, so are you saying, Matty, that if Neil Doncaster was to approach you with 100 grand and they offer it a hand job, you'd have changed your vote? Well, well what it is, I'll vote on it in the first place. <laughs> I'm a man of principles, John. I'm not that easily, but. <laughs> Now, if it was a gam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, right, I, we were right on our soapboxes there. Eh? Apologies to all the listeners who just uh, heard the decibel level when the, the pitch of the, <laughs> the podcast. These are the sort of conversations that need to be had, eh? rather than these daft fucking, like, just, uh, it's, that's the thing that winds me up. It's, as you say, it's nothing that's been backed up. It's just like, oh, well, we should have done this. They're do- England are doing it. Why can't we do it? It's far, far, far. <laughs> you feel like, you, so there was a, a, a Rangers fan who was on Twitter, and he, his whole point was Celtic got given the title. And that's what his, his grief, uh, gripe with, with the whole situation is he felt it was done to hand Celtic the title. Now, Celtic were about fucking 400 points clear. Like they were going to win the title. Eh? What, what way do you think? Like, Peter Law sitting there going, go and some can't eat a bat so we can get a disease and then we'll make a global pandemic and then we'll talk to Nicola Sturgeon and we'll get locked down, we'll get Boris involved and everything and then we can end the league early. We'll not play those last eight games just in case Rangers suddenly get their act together and the arse falls out of Celtic that we didn't get nine in a row. I mean, it's fucking ludicrous. And then he's like, it's, he's, he's better. He's saying, oh, the, the season should have been finished. Play it next season. You could do X, Y, and Z. The players could just do this. You go, they still can't play football today. And I, but they did it in Germany. Ah, they did it in Germany. They're not fucking locked down in Germany. They're allowed to play football in Germany. They did it in England. Same situation. I, I reckon how stupid folk have, uh, have to be to not do it. It's that bit about uh, willful ignorance, but I think folk deliberately didn't understand it. So they didn't have to say that they were wrong. Uh, it's when they turn in as well and they're like, oh, well, we could have played it out. Aye, but teams like Hamilton and that had 11 loan signings go out in fucking June or something after that. So loan signings ended, ended a month earlier than England's and all that. So, uh, ha- Hamilton fucking... was 12 players. Yeah. 12, 12 players. I finished the season, but we're a whole team's worth of players that you can't pick. Aye, that's fair. That's... Fuck that's me. That's really isn't it? Anyway, right. So, what uh, what are we? If if you were a better person, what are you putting your odds on? What's happening? What's the outcome going to be, John? Outcome of what? The uh, arbitration. All oh, right. Um, outcome maybe. outcome of this argument. <laughs> <laughs> Stick them up. I will call that a score. Well, I'll be John, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your heart's top and an eight-year-old laddie standing beside you. <laughs> Tag team <of> man. <laughs> Well, I, I was picturing that before when you were talking about um, like documents or smoking guns. I just expected like some sort of LA Law style courtroom where someone <laughs> comes in at the last second and says, I know it was you, Neil. <laughs> Doncaster finishes giving his evidence and Columbo pops him just, just one more thing. <laughs> just one more question. <laughs> um, uh, well, you might remember a couple of weeks ago, um, I said that it was seven zero days since I said that it would be a protracted farce. Uh, it's now 89 days, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's another twist in the tail following the the verdict. I don't know, is it even a verdict at arbitration, or is it just a, a yay or nay? Is it guilty, not guilty? I, I don't even know anymore. So, um, uh, what, what, hearts, what hearts have asked for is for... Um, Promotion and relegation not happen. So the current reconstruction is no within their powers. It'll only be that relegation and promotion doesn't happen or that they get compensation. So they've asked for eight million, Partick have asked for two million. That eight million. Well, that's a whole <laughs> other discussion, isn't it? That, <laughs> Where the fuck is that game Last from? time they got relegated, I think they were half a million quid up on their premiership season before it. So they should be paying everybody else, kind of like playing pleading hardship in it as they're going robbing Dundee United for their manager and Taking Jesus, yeah. Gordon in, but anyway, that's a discussion for another day. So those are the outcomes. Anyway, they either get promotion, and... relegation, or they get a nice payday, or presumably the arbitrate the court arbitration's got 
the flexibility to offer something else or say that they're due less than eight million, for example? Uh, yeah, I think I think they could do that. Um, but they can there won't be like an alternative solution that they can't go and say you need to do uh, reconstruction or, or anything like that. I think I think I'm probably in the same sort of pragmatic camp as you might like in terms of Celtic were you know, however many points they were ahead, Hearts were however many points they were behind. at shite. You kind of need to deal with it. If we were there, we'd have had to deal with the same thing. Like, I don't think there's any agenda there. I don't think there's any Illuminati conspiracy. And if I was a... Maybe maybe if I was a better man, I'd play the odds. But I do think that they'll probably come up with something similar. It's a shite situation. They dealt with it poorly, but they dealt with it fairly. I think I think the whole thing with the Illuminati back and all that sort of business... <laughs> It was, but but I mean, it's a fair point. It, it was all it, the whole reason people are believing this fucking sham. Really, it probably goes back to the Rangers statement when they called for Neil Doncaster. The dodgy, well, the Rodgers, that was a like, farce. That. Like so, I mean, I'm, it's it's difficult because there's so much, there's so many things that, that I personally think Hearts will lose it. Um, I think the only thing that they would kind of be hoping for would be something in these secret documents, but we've already talked about Deloitte's have done it um, independently. I don't think there's going to be anything that the Court of Arbitration finds, um, and I think Hearts will be relegated, and, and, and that'll be it. Will there be compensation? Well, I, I, I'm not going to claim to know anything about the Court of Arbitration, but if they can... They might turn around and, if, if they can, that is, and say, right, a wee bit of compensation for, for being seen off a bit because you still had the chance to stay up, but you were you were seen off. Um, but I can't, I can't see them winning it. Um, just fucking... It's got to the point now where it just has to end it. Like, it has to because it's now encroaching into the season. And... It's just fucking... Weird. My, my my big fat head kind of get I just kind of get around it. Eh? I just I like there's so many things, eh? There's so many daft things that it just has to end. And nah, they're not winning it. I'm going. I'm 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 going to say it now. Not winning it. You can crop that. You can crop that out if it comes back and it's wrong. And you can give me shite because that's what it's all about, isn't it? But nah, not happening. My my gut feeling is you're you're right, and I think I I go back just to to what we were talking about before, and you say, right, what, legally, have the SPFL done anything wrong? And I, I can't see that, that they have. I think they've acted in the best interest of the league all the way through. They've had votes when they need to have votes. They've met UEFA guidelines when UEFA have given guidelines. There's precedent in other countries, so France, for example, Belgium, um, Holland, they decided not to do anything. They null and voided the league, so it's slightly different. Um, I think there are other countries where, in fact, England as well have have, have done it, where they've uh, had to relegate uh, teams. That was the guidance. I, I don't think they've done anything wrong. I think it's harsh on Hearts, but I think they will ultimately be found that uh, I don't even necessarily think that they'll be entitled to compensation for it, because actually a relegated team doesn't get compensated in a normal season. So why why would you compensate them for for being relegated? If the rules have been followed, which they have. When when is it it's due to happen? When's it all when's it away day? When's kickoff? Um I think it's next week. I think they, they serve notice of it today. Um and then they'll they'll pick the pick the judges and then uh, go for next week. This was the other thing actually, they all got excited about um this is where I get carried away but they they got excited about the fact that the judge ruled how the um panel should be picked. And what the judge effectively did was just read out what the SFA rules already say about it. So <laughs> they thought they thought the SP the, the judge had clocked that the SPFL up to it, so he was going to try and make it even more independent. But all he did was read out the process. Um, so that there's no change there. And the other thing they're hanging their hopes on is the, the documents and thinking there's going to be a smoking gun. And what you need to remember is Neil Doncaster already the kids was in all those documents. Do you know what I mean? Like, if he was worried about it, he would, you know, they would be doing lots to kind of try and try and no, no have a, a hearing happen. They would be trying to take steps to, to avoid it. But he he counts the hand dodging there. Hearts are banking on something that they don't think exists. It's like they're, 
the documents whether there's something wrong in them or no. They're kind of banking on there being something in there and pinning the ropes in it. Don't is there any more? Is there any more costs that they could accrue due to going to arbitration? So say they lose. Aye. They, so there's more. So they they, they could, um, and I, I think effectively if they if the losers potential that they would have to pay during the United race. And uh, Cove Rangers, I think Cove Rangers are probably dropping out because they can't afford it. Pay their cost plus the SPFL. Sorry, I'd have to pay 50% of the SPFL's cost because they lost in, uh, on where it should be heard. So uh, I could be. This is, I had this argument on, on Twitter with Hearts fans. They, they were saying we're either going to get reinstated or we're going to get 8 million quid. Like that, those were the only two outcomes. Like none of them were thought, or you lose and you're on the hook for uh, You know, you get nothing and you have to pay. They're all like, no, no, it's a, a no lose situation. Well, it is a, uh, there is a lose scenario in there, and that lose is he's getting a call. Here's which a is one that we're hoping for, fingers crossed. See if they lose. Can you bump the lawyers? No. Like you did with like poppy funds. Oh, and like whatnot. if, 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 if aye, well, there's that, eh? they could just, uh, just shut up shopping and say, oh, we've not got the money and we're going into administration. So, are they kind of like accounts of football debt or no? I, I don't know. Knows. Anyway, right, will we wrap up? Probably before Craig goes off in one again. Oh. <laughs> I've been watching uh, Boardwalk Empire. Let's, we just finished the Sopranos. Watch the uh, Sopranos from start to finish. Incredible season uh, series that. Like, I watched it once before, years ago, and I never watched an episode after it. And so I forgot most. I have a terrible memory for things. So when we started watching it again, it was like watching it for the start again. Superb. He's both seen it, I take it. Aye. No, yeah. I've just I've just started. I've seen uh, ha- first episode. I, I I wish I was in your position. Honestly, yeah. I wish I was able to watch it again. When they know it was good watching it a second time, but I wish I could if, if I could we'd just go back and watch it again. But we started watching Boardwalk Empire, uh, which we've seen when it was broadcast on on Sky Atlantic way back when. So we just started watching that again. So that's what I'm going to go and do now. So it's good. If you should watch it, I'd recommend it. Anyway, right, so uh, that was episode 57-ish. Uh, well done if you made it this far. Thanks to everybody <laughs> who got in touch and contributed ideas, especially the open letter, um, which was phenomenal. We'll be back with another one when we can be asked. If something happens that we, is worth talking about, we'll probably team up to do it. I think all I can do is apologise. <laughs> that that's, that's all we can that all was, do. <laughs> that was a... Uh, that was, a, that was some, wasn't it? <laughs> you did well, mate. Uh, right, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll, we'll see you on next time. Cheers. Bye.